serve as guides for us in this dunya and in the akhirah. These 12 shining stars come from the family and the progeny of God's greatest messenger, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. If we want to achieve salvation and success, we have to develop a strong relationship with our Imams. They are our leaders. Allah has blessed us with these amazing leaders. Our youngsters, our families must live with the spirit of the Imams, the teachings of the Imams, the lessons that we have from the Imams. I'll be very honest with you. Unfortunately, in many of our communities and families, you find our kids, mashallah, when it comes to entertainment, sports, they have excellent memory. They can tell you about the lives of 50 or 100 sports actors or actors in Hollywood. They know their history. They know the sports actor, how many you know, scores he's made in the past. And they can go on for hours and hours knowing about these figures. But when it comes to our 12 Imams of Ahlul Bayt, we really don't know much about them. Especially the later Imams, Al Imam Al Jawad, Al Imam Al Hadi, Al Imam Al Askari. Rarely do we know anything about them. And this is a tragedy because Allah has blessed us with these shining stars. So we benefit from them. Based on this, my dear brothers and sisters, it was suggested that we offer a series on the life of the Imams to go through their life one by one to know them, to know some brief information about their biography, and to learn from their lessons. The more we know about these Imams, the more successful become, we become. The Imam teach us how to be successful, how to be hardworking, how to be sincere, how to prepare for your Akhirah. And the Hadith states, one hour of contemplation and seeking knowledge is more valuable than 70 years of praying, of salah. Or another hadith says 70 rak'ahs of salah. So this is a wonderful opportunity for us to seek knowledge and get closer to our faith, my dear brothers and sisters. Now in our discussion this evening, we will offer some introductory points about the Imams. And then in our subsequent uh, lessons insha'Allah, we will start with Imam Ali السلام, all the way till Al Imam al-Mahdi. But it's very important for us in our discussion today to know the significance of the Imams. I know many people constantly ask this following question. Is there any evidence in the Quran that we have to follow the Imams? What are the primary attributes of the Imams? Why should we follow them? Why are they significant in our lives? So inshallah, we'll have this discussion. And then towards the end of our discussion, I would be happy to address any questions that you have. So now let's begin by addressing this very important question. Let's get to know these Imams by asking this question. Are the Imams chosen by Allah, God, or the people can choose these Imams for themselves? Now, to give you an overview of what Muslims say, Muslims split up into two main sects. We have the Sunni sect and we have the Shia sect. The Sunni sect says that the Caliph who represents the Prophet or the Imam who leads the Ummah can be selected by the people. That is the opinion of the majority of our Sunni brothers and sisters. Now, in the Shia school of thought, in the Ahlul Bayt school of thought, we believe that only Allah has the right to choose the Imam, not the people. The question is, rationally, why is that the case? And number two, where's the evidence from the Quran? And I invite my dear brothers and sisters to write these notes because this will be very helpful for you to refer to in the future. Because you will get into these discussions and dialogues. So now rationally, from an intellectual, rational perspective, why is it that only Allah can choose the Imam? 
Someone can say, we can gather. We've got a lot of people in society who are wise and let them choose an imam. Rationally, only God can choose the imam for two reasons, two primary reasons. Number one, the imam must be infallible. Infallible is ma'soom in Arabic, which means error-free, sin-free. You can trust an imam whom you know will not commit a sin, who will always guide you to the right path, just like the prophets of God. Because the imams are a continuation of the message of the prophet. The prophet brought the message, the imams protect the message. So the imams must be infallible. Now who other than God knows who is infallible and who will stay infallible? Only God can know that. Only God knows that this person is error-free, is sincere, does not commit any sins, will not make any mistakes. And you can count on this person to lead you unconditionally. Only Allah has such knowledge. Therefore, logically, rationally, only God can choose the imam. That's the first point. The second point is knowledge. The imam who's going to lead you must have the full knowledge, must be the most knowledgeable. Allah can only choose someone who has absolute knowledge and correct knowledge, who will not give you any false knowledge, any false you know, information. We human beings, we make mistakes. Even the best of us, sometimes we, make, we may make errors. Sometimes we may give misinformation, even if we have good intentions. But the imam must be a source where you can always go to and trust. You must trust the knowledge of the imam and to know that the imam has the full knowledge. Only Allah can choose such a person. So rationally, we have examined two pieces of evidence that God must choose the imam. The imam must be infallible, error-free, sin-free. And number two, the imam must have pure knowledge and the complete knowledge. Therefore, Allah is the one who chooses the imam. Now that's the rational intellectual perspective. What about the Quran? Is there anything in Quran that demonstrates God chooses such people? Yes. Let's look at basically two main words that are used to refer to an imam. Imam and Khalifa. When we look at the Quran, we find that the imam and the khalifa is chosen by God. The first example that I want you all to be familiar with is Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 124. Allah talks about Ibrahim alayhi salam. Ibrahim was a prophet. Then he passed his test. God made him a messenger, Rasul. Then he kept elevating in his iman until he became Khalil al-Rahman. He became the intimate friend of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah gave him that honor. But what is the highest level that Ibrahim achieved? So chapter 2, Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 124 tells us, Allah says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, وَإِذِ ابْتَلَىٰ إِبْرَاهِيمَ رَبُّهُ بِكَلِمَاتٍ فَأَتَمَّهُنْ Allah tried Ibrahim, difficult trials. He completed those trials. When he completed those trials, how did Allah honor Ibrahim? What did he do? Allah said to Ibrahim, I have chosen you as an imam to the people. See, Allah says, I have chosen you as an imam. So if you look at the Quran, the Quran is very clear that an imam is to be chosen by God. Not by this ummah or people in this ummah, they gather somewhere and they choose the imam for them. No, the imam must be chosen by Allah. So that's the first proof from the Holy Quran. Now let's look at another word, which means also imam, which is khalifa. Khalifa in Arabic means caliph, successor, representative. Now, the, rep the representative of the Prophet, the Khalifa of the Prophet must be chosen by Allah. 
Because Allah, in a few verses of the Quran, when he talks about Khalifa, Allah says, I choose the Khalifa. See, when God refers to Prophet Dawood السلام, who was the Khalifa of God on earth, Allah says, Ya Dawood, inna ja'alna ka khalifatan fil ard. O oh, Dawood, we've made you as a Khalifa. See, God chooses the Khalifa, not the people. Adam السلام, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informed the angels, how does the Quran phrase it? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the malaika, Inni ja'ilun fil ardi khalifa. I will appoint a khalifa on earth. So if you look at the word imam, it's by God, God's designation. If you look at the word khalifa, it's by divine selection. This automatically tells us, my dear brothers and sisters, that the imams are chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So now we've demonstrated rationally, logically, why the imam must be chosen. Number two, this is uh, evidence from the Holy Quran. That is the first point of our discussion, that Allah chooses the imams. Let's now move to the second point of our discussion. And uh, I remind you that this is an introductory discussion that we have today before we actually look at the lives of the Imams, because it's important for us to know the position of Imam. The second point about the Imams is that they must be infallible, right? They must be error free. And that's how we trust them. Any command that the Imam gives us, how do I trust that this command is right, is just, and will bring me closer to God? Only if the Imam is infallible. Ma'soom, error-free. Is there any evidence in the Qur'an that the Imam, the Khalifa, must be infallible or no? Let's examine a few verses here, my dear brothers and sisters. The first verse that we examine in the Qur'an that demonstrates the Imam must be infallible is the following. Surah An-Nisa, that's chapter 4 of the Holy Qur'an, verse 59 Surah An-Nisa verse 59 What does Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala state in this verse Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu ati'u Allah O you who believe obey Allah Question Do we obey Allah unconditionally or with conditions Meaning if God gets it right we obey him or no it's unconditional obviously it's unconditional we obey allah no matter what because allah is the source of all goodness so any command god gives us we obey unconditionally so the quran says Allah, obey god and obey the messenger the prophet conditionally or unconditionally See, when the Qur'an tells us obey Allah and the messenger, that means just like you obey God in all matters, you ought to obey the Prophet in all matters. That means you obey the Prophet unconditionally. And this can only make sense to obey the Prophet unconditionally only and only if the Prophet is ma'soom, only if the Prophet is infallible. So you obey him no matter what. You obey him unconditionally. Okay, the verse does not stop there. What does Allah say after that? Allah, number one. Wa number two. Wa amri min kum, and obey the guardians, the guardians amongst you. Those who have authority. We automatically know that whoever ulil amr are, they must be infallible. Because God is commanding us to obey them just like we obey the Prophet and just like we obey Allah unconditionally. Same context, same sentence in the, in the verse of the Holy Quran. So that means ulil amr are infallible. And the ulil amr, when we go and examine the hadith of the Prophet alayhi he makes it very clear that the ulil amr are his Ahlul Bayt, the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. So that's proof that those who have authority after the Prophet whom we follow must be infallible because God commands us 
to obey them unconditionally. That's the first proof in the Holy Quran. The second proof in the Holy Quran that the Imams must be infallible is the verse about Ibrahim which, which, which we just discussed. Remember when Ibrahim completed his trials. Now that's verse 124 of Surah Al-Baqarah. So what happened? Allah made him, made him an Imam, right? When Ibrahim was told by God that he became an Imam, what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell him? Allah told him, I'll make you an Imam. Ibrahim, how did he respond to that? Did he say, wow, this is an amazing position, oh Allah? He said one thing. See, Ibrahim loved his dhurriya, his progeny, his children, grandchildren, offspring. He asked, oh Allah, will anyone from my progeny have the honor of being an imam too? What did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala respond to him? Allah said, this covenant position of imamah, those who do zulum, who do injustice, oppression, they are not entitled to it. That means they must be infallible. Because if you commit one sin, that's zulum, zulmun nafs. You're oppressing yourself. And we know that none of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ were infallible except Imam Ali ﷺ. See, even those other companions in Mecca, they were idol worshippers. They were worshipping the idols. And the Quran says, إِنَّ الشِّرْكَ لَظُلْمٌ عَظِيمٌ Shirk, worshipping the idols, is a great act of injustice. Yes, many of them did sincerely repent. That's fine. But in the end, they did commit shirk in their lives. They're not qualified to be an imam. To be an imam, you have to be sin-free throughout your entire life. Because Allah tells Ibrahim, the one who does zulum, injustice, is not qualified to be an imam. That's evidence from the Holy Quran. And that's uh, verse 124 of Surah Al-Baqarah. So now we have demonstrated that the imam must be ma'soom, infallible. And there is Quranic evidence for that. I want you all, my dear and beloved brothers and sisters, to be familiar with these verses. This is our book of guidance. There are Muslims out there who might challenge you. Be ready to, to discuss these proofs and pieces of evidence. Now, is there any reference in the Holy Quran to Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, being the Imam? Yes. Let's look at this reference. This one's easy to memorize. Chapter 5, verse 55. Surah Al-Ma'idah, verse 55. Allah tells us who the guardians are, whom we must follow. Allah says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Innama waliyukum Allah. Your wali, your guardian is Allah. You follow him. Who else? Wa rasuluhu. And the Prophet, he is the guardian that we follow. Then who else? وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا And those who believe. They are your guardians. But the Quran, tell us a little bit more about those who believe. Who are they? Be specific. So, we see that the Holy Quran describes to us who these believers are. وَرَسُولُهُ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا Those who believe. They establish regular prayers. And they give the zakat while in the state of ruku. Allah is telling us, these are your imams, your guardians. Now let's look at history. Who at the time of the Prophet gave zakat in his ruku? If you look at the books of tafsir, and the books of history, the one who did that was Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. He was in the masjid. He was in his salah praying the mustahab prayers. A poor man walks in. The imam is in ruku' and the imam would prolong his ruku' to show his obedience to Allah. 
The poor man begged for money. He extended his hand. Oh, Ali, give me money. The Imam had a ring. The Imam had a ring. So the Imam extended his hand, telling him, signaling to him that here, you can take this ring and that's my charity. So he gave his ring in Salah. That man, he went, he sold the ring and he had some food to eat. Allah revealed this verse in the Holy Quran to the Prophet. He told him, Ya Rasulullah, Ali ibn Abi Talib is the Imam, is the guardian. Because your guardians are those who believe, who pray, and in their salah, they give their zakat, they give their charity. So that's evidence, my dear brothers and sisters here, that Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, is the representative of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, and this is from the Holy Quran. Now we also have Sahih Hadith that demonstrates Imam Ali السلام, is our wali and our guardian. I'm sure many of you have heard of Hadith Al-Ghadir. Hadith Al-Ghadir is a Sahih Hadith hundreds and hundreds and thousands and thousands of companions they recorded this Hadith that they heard the Prophet say at the oasis of Ghadir, as the Prophet was coming back from his final Hajj, he took the hands of Imam Ali and he said, Man kuntu maulah, he who I am his guardian and you follow me as the Prophet, Fa'aliyun maulah. Ali is also his guardian. You have to follow him. So here clearly, the Prophet declared Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib as the successor after him. So this is the first hadith that demonstrates Imam Ali is the Khalifa and the Imam. Another hadith is called Hadith al-Dar. Uh, brothers and sisters, I'm not sure if you are familiar with Hadith al-Dar, but Hadith al-Dar is a very important hadith. Basically, the Prophet was in Mecca. This was early, in, early on after he received revelation, after the religion of Islam was uh, being preached by the Prophet. The Prophet gathered 40 of his relatives and he gave them dinner. He invited them and over there at the dinner, he told them that I have been sent by Allah as a messenger. Now this hadith is documented in Sunni sources and Shia sources. It's called Hadith al-Dar, the hadith of the Dar, of the house. So the Prophet told them, I've been sent as a messenger by God. Now I want a Khalifa who is going to now support me and defend my message and he will be chosen as a Khalifa. He will be my Khalifa. Who's willing? No one stood up except young Ali ibn Abi Talib Three times the Prophet made that offer. No one got up. No one accepted the invitation except Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib. He stood up and he accepted the invitation. He said, Ya Rasulullah, I accept. So the Prophet held his hand and he told those people at the gathering, bear witness that Ali is not only my brother, but he is also my Khalifa after me. So the Prophet appointed Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, as the Khalifa. So my dear brothers and sisters, we've demonstrated so far that the Imam is infallible, chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and these are Quranic references that point to who the guardians are and what kind of qualities they must have. Another very important quality, as we mentioned, is knowledge. Ilm. The Imam must have the full knowledge. And there is no question, my dear brothers and sisters, that the most knowledgeable after the Prophet was Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib He was by far the most knowledgeable to the point where the Prophet said, Ana Madinatul Ilm. I am the city of knowledge and Ali is the gate. You want to come to the city of knowledge? You go through the gate. Who is Ali ibn Abi Talib These are the words of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. If I need to go to the Prophet, I need to go through the door of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Imam Ali takes me to the knowledge of the Prophet. 
So we have many narrations and verses about the knowledge of the Imam. The last verse in Surah Al-Ra'd, my dear brothers and sisters, قُلْ كَفَى بِاللَّهِ شَهِيدًا بَيْنِي وَبَيْنَكُمْ وَمَنْ عِنْدَهُ عِلْمُ الْكِتَابِ the Prophet says, Allah is my witness between you, me and you, O pagans, unbelievers. And the one who has the full knowledge of the book. If you look at the hadith of the Prophet and the books of tafsir, this is a reference to Imam Ali alayhi salam. He is the one who had the full knowledge of the Quran. And the Quran contains all the knowledge. It's embedded in it. So if Imam Ali has all the knowledge of the Quran, he has access to all the knowledge from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is evidence from the Quran that the Imam Ali salam has full knowledge. By the way, to give you two quick examples of Imam Ali's knowledge, there was this Khariji, Ibn al-Kawa. He was known for hating Imam Ali. You know, some people have a disease of their hearts. They're jealous. They cannot stand to see the virtues of Ali ibn Abi Talib. So one day, Imam Ali is praying in the Masjid of Kufa, Salat al-Jama'ah. He's about to say, Allahu Akbar. This evil man, he said, let me distract Ali ibn Abi Talib. I'm going to throw a question at him. If Ali ibn Abi Talib answers the question, the answer is very long. He's going to get distracted from Salah and this will ruin his prayer. And people will laugh at him. And if he doesn't answer, then people will say, Oh, haram, Ali ibn Abi Talib doesn't have knowledge. This was his strategy. So the Imam's about to say, Allahu Akbar, he came from behind and he said, Oh, Ali, I have a question. Tell me which animals lay an egg and which animals give birth? Tell me. So now he thought his strategy is going to work. If Imam Ali wants to go through the list of animals, this animal lays an egg, this gives birth, this, you know, this is going to be a long list and it's going to ruin the salah. And if the Imam doesn't answer him, he's going to say, oh, see, Ali ibn Abi Talib doesn't know everything. He claims to know everything, but he doesn't. The Imam Ali salam answered him and he quieted him in one sentence. SubhanAllah, it just shows you the Ahlul Bayt they receive their knowledge from God, even in worldly scientific matters, not just religious matters. The Imam told him, uh, he's now referring to land animals. The man asked about land animals. The Imam Ali Salam told him, I'll answer you in one sentence. All the animals that have protruding ears, like extending ears, they give birth. Basically, they're mammals. And all those animals that don't have a visible protruding ear, they lay an egg. Allahu Akbar, and the Imam started his salah. Subhanallah. At the time, people didn't really know this. Now, over time, scientists began to discover that, yeah, mammals have protruding ears. They give birth. They don't lay an egg. Whereas other types of animals, like birds, for instance, or like a lot of reptiles, they actually lay an egg. Look at the knowledge of Imam Ali, alayhi salam. Believe me, any type of knowledge you want, you find it in Imam Ali. You want science, go to Ali ibn Abi Talib. You want psychology, go to Ali ibn Abi Talib. You want spirituality, go to Imam Ali. You want the knowledge of Quran, go to Ali ibn Abi Talib. You want the path to success, go to Ali ibn Abi Talib. He is the source of guidance after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. So this is an example of the amazing knowledge of Imam Ali. Another quick example. Once the Khawarij wanted to test Imam Ali to see is he limited in his knowledge or he has a lot of knowledge. They said, let's ask him the same question. We'll send 10 men. Each one of them asks the same question. If Ali gives us the same answer, that means he doesn't have that much knowledge. But if he gives us a new answer each time, that means he's got a lot of knowledge. So the first man, Khariji, he goes to Imam Ali. He tells him, oh, Ali, tell us, is knowledge better or money? He said, no, knowledge is better. He's like, why? He said, because money, the more you increase it, the more it decreases, right? But knowledge, the more you spread it, the more you spend it, the more it increases and it spreads beautifully. So that's why knowledge is better. 
the man was amazed at the response. Another man goes to Imam Ali alayhi salam. Oh Ali, is knowledge better or is money better? The Imam said, no, knowledge is better. He said, why? He thought Imam Ali is going to give the same answer. He said, because money, you have to protect it all the time, especially in the past when there were no bank accounts. You need to put it in a safe box. You need to put it in the bank. You have to protect your money, whereas knowledge, it protects you. So knowledge is better than money. The third guy goes to Imam Ali. The Imam gives him another answer. The fourth guy, fifth, sixth, ten of them. Ten of them go. The Imam gives each of them a different answer. Then you know what the Imam said at the end? The Imam said, I swear by Allah, if the people keep asking me this question until the day of judgment, every single time I will give a new, unique, different answer. That's Ali ibn Abi Talib, sallallahu alayhi And if you just look at Nahj al-Balagha, you know, inshallah, we'll talk about that in our next class as we examine the life of Imam Ali. Nahj al-Balagha is an ocean. It's a treasure, my dear brothers and sisters. Let's get to know these treasures. So the Imam Ali salam has the full knowledge. So the Imams whom we believe in, the reason why we hold on to them is because they're infallible. We trust their source. Number two, they have the full knowledge. We can trust their knowledge. They can show us right from wrong with accuracy without making any mistakes. And no one after the Prophet has that virtue except the 12 shining stars of the Ahlul Bayt. Beginning from Imam Ali alayhi salam all the way to Imam al-Mahdi. The Prophet in numerous hadiths, he spoke about the 12. The number 12 is not only mentioned in Shia sources, even in Bukhari, even in Sunni sources, the Prophet said 12 emirs, rulers, leaders will come after me. They are divinely appointed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's incumbent on, upon us to know them, my dear brothers and sisters. Not knowing the Imam of your time is a type of defect in your belief. The Prophet ﷺ famously stated in Sunni sources, in Shia sources, من مات ولم يعرف إمام زمانه مات ميتة جاهلية If you die without knowing your Imams, you die like the pagans. Allah wants us to know the Imams, brothers and sisters, to follow the Imams, learn from the Imams, make the Imams your best friends. Believe me, you learn from them. Make Imam Ali your best friend. He teaches you how to be patient, strong, how to navigate tragedies. Imam Hussein teaches you how to rise to injustice. Imam Al Hassan teaches you how to sacrifice sometimes your reputation and dignity for the greater good, to protect your community, to protect your family. Sometimes you go and you help other people in society. And you sacrifice from your time. Or if you want to make peace between people, yeah, sometimes people will start attacking you. Or sometimes you want to do a good project for the community. People start talking about you. It's okay. Imam al Hassan says, for Allah, give from your reputation. It's okay. Let people talk about you. It's important that what you do is right. We learn from Imam Zain al Abideen how to connect to Allah through dua, even if you're ill. You know, he's called Al-Alil in Arabic because he was, uh, throughout the journey of Karbala, the Imam was extremely sick. If you're sick, if you know a sick family member, you seek inspiration from Imam Zain al abidin And so on and so forth. Inshallah, we'll get to the Imams one by one. But these shining stars of Ahlul Bayt are an inspiration for us, my dear brothers and sisters. Knowing them, familiarizing ourselves with their lives will ensure that we are successful in the eyes of Allah our families are successful in the eyes of Allah. Because you know the reality is on the day of judgment, Allah is going to resurrect you on what basis? He's going to organize us in groups. What factor will determine which group we will belong to? Our race? No. Our ethnicity? No. Our wealth? Our money? Our power? Our geography? None of that matters on the Day of Judgment. One thing matters. Surah Al-Isra, verse 71. 
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يوم ندعو كل أناس بإمامه on the day of judgment we'll call on every group of people with their imam which imam did you follow who was your leader as an imam if you followed the right imams you're safe on the day of judgment because Allah says in Surah Al-Isra verse 71 that he will resurrect you with the imam that you follow so that's why it's very important my dear brothers and sisters, for us to get to know the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them. So today's discussion was an introductory uh, lesson for us to know the status of the Imams and to have evidence from the Holy Quran and from the Hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Inshallah, in our um, subsequent lessons, which are twice a month, bi-weekly, uh, about the, uh, the series of the 12 Imams, Inshallah, next, we'll start to examine the life of the Imams. We'll break them down. We start with Imam Ali, and one by one, we will examine the lives of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt.